Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Don McGuire, the SVP and CMO for Qualcomm. Don was recently named one of the Forbes most 50 influential CMOs, and we're so happy to have you here today. Great to see you, Don. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So we're at CES. I'm sure this is a huge event for Qualcomm for a variety of reasons. Uh, talk to us about what you're seeing here at CES and what you hope to get accomplished. Uh, sure. I think for us, as well as for CES in general, the show has sort of evolved. Um, you know, we have that little COVID oh, yeah. uh, thing happened in the middle, but I think over time it, it has evolved and, you know, new things have taken center stage. And uh, I think pr just prior to COVID, and I think carrying over even to today, CES seems to be um, a lot about cars. Um, and there seems to be a lot of automotive news and a lot of automotive presence at CES. And then add on top of that, this sort of constant narrative and hype cycle around AI. I think those are two of the things. And then traditionally, you kind of see these, you know, the big TVs and the new displays yeah. and the new screens. And that's always been a sort of a mainstay of CES. Um, so, you know, we see a little bit of that here today as well with the transparent displays. Pretty cool. So for us, uh, it, it, the last couple of years, it's really been about automotive as a centerpiece with a sprinkling of other things around. Uh, and so I would say, you know, 80% automotive, 20% Gen AI is kind of our recipe this year. Um, and we've leaned in on Gen AI across different product, product categories based on kind of what's being talked about here at the show. So there's like AI PC, which has been a topic here at the sure. show. There's, there's other things going on. And so we've kind of leaned in across those different categories. So that's, that's kind of CES 2024 for us. Yeah. Well, let's unpack there. When you talk about the focus on auto, we can get at it in a second, but also kind of the focus on Gen AI, you know, there was a time when CES was all about this is 4K TV, right. it's a bigger TV, this is a, a smaller recording device. And right. I feel like that hardware has kind of become somewhat commoditized because everybody has great screens, everyone has fast devices, and now it is much more about the software. And you kind of see that happen with the iPhone development cycle right. and, and the demand kind of waning. What are your thoughts on that overall? Yeah, I think it's either um, it's either been about other industries go undergoing transformation. Sure. Um, and that's either being driven by software. Right. Um, uh, like, the case of auto. like the case of auto, yeah. right? I don't think there's any other industry that's undergone in the last five years more transformation than automotive, mm -hmm. where cars are less about mechanics um, and MPG, right? And MPH and and torque and thrust and all that stuff. It's, and it's more about digital Yep. capabilities, right? And technology. become a docking station for my life. Exactly. Or a, a new living space. Right. Um, and, and so that has been amazing to watch and participate in. Um, and we're a huge participate, participant in that as well as a huge enabler of it. Yeah. So with our Snapdragon digital chassis um, solution. So that's been super cool to see, but you're right. I mean, the software defined vehicle is now what's driving the automotive industry. So software seems to be driving a lot of the, the innovation and transformation versus form factor right right or or, or even things. performance or even performance right um in some ways performance has become commoditized unless it's in the context of something new right so instead of talking about for example i'll give you a pc example or even a another device where in the past what you looked for was cpu performance for example like how fast is this processor how fast is my pc and and you know kind of the the ecosystem built a whole new narrative for years around, hey, CPU, CPU, CPU. Yeah. Um, but then gamers came about and the conversation shifted in the gaming context to, oh, no, 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 it's all about GPU, right? GPU, GPU. Well, now in the advent of the AI PC, which, you know, has been kicked off sort of last year, we announced our Snapdragon X Elite platform at our Snapdragon Summit in October and the capabilities of that platform. We're going to see that show up in PCs in you know June of this year and going forward. And then here at the show, there's, you know, the PC ecosystem is talking about the advent of AI PC, Microsoft's launching the Copilot key, right, on your on your keyboard, et cetera. But now when a consumer walks in to a Best Buy to buy a new PC going forward, 2024, 2025 and beyond, or an enterprise CIO is saying, how do I upgrade my hardware, my devices for my workforce? It's less about CPU and probably even less about GPU, and it's more about MPU. Right. Right. What is the AI performance going to be on this PC so I can take advantage of all these great co-pilot experiences that Microsoft has built on top of Windows? Um, so this shift is happening where, um, where, where the innovation, yes, it's software driven, but it's also what's happening within the device that's creating this new level of performance. Um, and so that's interesting to watch. 
is the power of AI beholden in the actual local device or in the actual servers delivering the AI? Because like, the, you know, there's a tool like Pika, uh, you know, which is text to video mm -hmm. or runway where it right. takes forever, but it won't for it won't forever. Just like you take forever to get on dial up. Right? right. But probably two years from now, you'll just be able to type, show me a video of a cat running around the roller coaster and it'll just get it instantly. But is is the hold up there the local device that you have or is it the servers that are delivering the AI functionality? This is a great question because in order for AI to scale, both from a technology perspective and a usability perspective, it's going to have to be hybrid. Meaning not everything can happen in the cloud. Right. In some cases, it takes too long. Um, the workloads are too much, right? The taxing on the data center is too much. Um, the economic model doesn't work, right? Um, you can't buy enough cards to put into your data center. You can't you know, overutilize water resources to cool your data centers right. so that you've got a sustainability problem. You've got an economic model problem. Um, and you have a data privacy and personalization problem. Yeah. So a certain amount of computational work for that drives AI and the ability to deliver an AI solution based on algorithms or large language, small language, medium language models is where is it going to happen contextually based on what is it that you want to do? So on-device AI, which has been on-device for 10 years, um, AI has been running in the background, whether you know it or not, on devices like smartphones for a long time. Right. It's been making your photos better. It's making your music sound better. It's been doing things that you didn't probably know or realize that AI was actually doing that. Uh, and AI has been part of our Snapdragon platform for years. Um, it was really Gen AI that thrusted AI into the spotlight. It was like the press release for yeah. AI, so to speak. Packaged it for consumers. It packaged yeah. it for consumers, made it novel, and created the hype cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but unlike other hype cycles, it's not going to stop, right? It's not going to go up and then go down. It's here to stay, and it's moving very fast. Um, but in order for it to, to scale, the technology that enables it is going to have to normalize across the spectrum of the device itself, the edge, which is really on-prem, right? Right. So whether that, your, that prem is your home network or is your campus network or is your office network. And does 5G play a role in that? 5G plays a role in that. Right. Um, Wi-Fi, 6, 7, 6, e, 7, 8, whatever plays a role in that. Um, and then the cloud and the data center and the big cloud. So if you're talking about something like, hey, AI assistant, help me plan my day, most of that can be handled on device. Right. And and that's instantaneous. It's it's information, it's interaction that you want it's text. at low latency. It's text. It might be some some image, um, yeah. things like that. But we're talking about trillions of parameters like help me solve world hunger, AI, right? That is data center, big computing. Um, it's gonna take some time. The latency is not an issue. It's really about getting to the right answer. Um, so it's everything in between there. So it's gonna be contextual to what is the task. Um, and if you normalize the technology stack across device, edge, and cloud, um, then it becomes more useful for everybody. You can actually do, you can actually load more tools and more experiences on top of that, and you can put them in the bucket that they need to go into to deliver the best experience to the user for whatever that might be. And then that's going to enable the second part, which is the usability and the relevance of AI really has to move from prompted and reactive to anticipatory and suggestive. Right. And if, if it's gonna actually be useful and not just novel. But that uh, means that the user has to be able to let the AI know more about them. Exactly. Right. But it's up to the user. Right. Right, especially in the case of AI at the edge, right? You're in control. The human element is always in control. So you allow it to learn as much as you want it to learn about you, and then you allow it to suggest or recommend in the context of your private network or yeah. data set, whether it's on device and it never leaves, or whether it's in your home and never leaves, or, or in the cloud, in the protected, cloud right. protected, or, hey, I don't care where this goes, train you know your algorithms on it, I'm cool, right? So it's it's everywhere in between. Um, so I think that's the, really the beauty, the excitement of it all, but it's it doesn't just stop with chat GBT, going to the data center, sometimes you get a response, sometimes you don't, sometimes it says come back later. Yeah. Right? Um, because it's taxing a resource, um, because everything else has to catch up, uh, and that's where Qualcomm really plays a big role is at that edge, right? So from the on-prem to on-device, um, it's our sweet spot, 
right? We've been doing this on device for years. Um, we make kick-ass pro processors and, 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 and semiconductors and chips. Um, and we have this long history in DNA in wireless connectivity. Yeah. And Wi-Fi. So that high speed. That's how most people know you, right? For the what? Right. Historically, yeah. But right. I mean, you know, since I've been at Qualcomm, what seven and a half years now, we 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 were already underway of this transformation and, and diversification of less about connectivity, still about connectivity and first class and world leading connectivity, but more about on top of that connectivity, computing. Yeah. Right. And which is why you know now what we stand for is really intelligent computing everywhere so the everywhere is the nod to the connectivity the intelligent computing is really the nod to the ai plus the processing power together in a really um energy efficient package yeah right because that's another thing right you can't perform really large tasks ai tasks especially on a device that has a battery life of right. a day and a half unless you want a battery life of two seconds <laughs> right. you know so that again that's why this thing has to be hybrid one big balancing act exactly and so it's 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 an ecosystem play everyone's involved um and it's exciting we have our role everybody has their role no one's right no one's wrong right um it's not a us versus them it's not a Qualcomm versus Nvidia it's not a Microsoft versus somebody else it's really about everybody has a role to play who is involved in developing technology uh, and then where is that where do all the puzzle pieces fit so even the content careers, like you see the New yeah. York Times and you know their lawsuit Publishers. with OpenAI, yeah. yeah. Well, and technology is just technology until you put it to use, right? Right. right? When and, it becomes you know, commercialized and it gets a little murky. Well, and you know, anything new, there's always trial and error. Yeah. Um. Sometimes bad things happen. Happen with YouTube and happen with, with Spotify, Napster. I mean, it yeah. goes back. It yeah. goes back. Um. And you know, there are bad actors and. Yeah, you know, and good actors in every and, category. In every category, and I, in my speakership I did earlier today, I talked about look if we could just because I'm not a huge fan of regulatory oversight in general um, because it's too slow. Yeah, and by the time they get something regulated, it's already moved beyond the regulation. Totally right, and so it's irrelevant. If I can't keep up, how's the government going to exactly. keep up? Right, and especially with AI, it's moving so fast. Yeah, and so um, so it's really about standards and governance and practices that and best practices that can be adopted and principles um and if we can learn the lessons from social media where there was none of that right it kind of went untethered so to speak for years um and you got a lot of good out of it absolutely um it opened the world up to so many people connected so many people connected so yeah. many people but it also created mental health issues or enabled the environment. Geopolitical this. issues. Geopolitical yeah. issues, bullying, yeah. um, you know, all these types of things. So if we could learn some lessons from maybe a little earlier in the social media technology evolution, um, we could have anticipated some of those things and said, hey, you know what? We're going to have some principles. Who's we though? I think everyone involved. Right. Right. It's not just Like a consortium? Meta. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, it's not just meta. It's, you know, because you can't just blame one party right. or can't point a finger because guess what you may be nobody's out you know everyone likes to think they're altruistic but at the end of the day if you are advertising on that platform that's then responsible for enabling bad behavior you're culpable and meta has shareholders and their shareholders could be endowments of colleges it's like yeah. so that they need to deliver a return funds. right pension funds exactly right right and so it's like it's this vast web right, right. and so it's like everybody has to kind of Join together and just say, okay, how are we going to operate this thing, this beast? Um, and I know that's not easy. It's easy to say, not easy to do. Um, but you know, we've we've joined a bunch of companies in, de in co-developing some basic principles for you know deploying AI and and um, you know along with Microsoft and others and ethical principles about how we're going to create the technology. Um, I think those types of things. You know, you look at platforms like Reddit, which are kind of community managed, self governed, yeah. so to speak. Wikipedia, um, like Wikipedia. Yeah, and it's it works in that context. Obviously, I'm not saying it'll work everywhere, but if you take some concept of self governance and then you add some other things and to uh insurance policy so to speak um i think we can get there yeah and i think we can prevent some of the badness right that came along with social media right um so, and every technological innovation had badness there's car accidents right still today <laughs> right right um it's funny like technology is funny there's a lot of fear right and i know a lot of people are fearful of ai and it's been used as a narrative, right? Uh, it was used in the writer strike and the actor strike. Yep. Um, you know, people fear job loss and all these other things. A lot of that's just posturing, um, because it's like I use the analogy of the elevator, right? 
the elevator first was invented, nobody would ride it. Because they were scared? They were scared. Right. They didn't want to plummet to their death. Right. But then Otis came along, who didn't invent the elevator first, by the way. They, he, they invented the latch that caught the elevator. Right. So Interesting. once that was invented, people were like, oh, it's safe. Right. This thing's going to catch it. Right. And so they start riding the elevator. Right. Uh, so it's like that is a natural type of part of process that we go through as human beings um, and with any technology. Uh, so um, so I think we're going to go through those same types of things yes. with with AI as well as as well as other things. Autonomous driving. That's another thing. Right. That, uh, you know, whether we get to full autonomy and how and what context it's going to be very interesting to watch. And you're going to have people that point to, oh, see that accident. But it's like, okay, well, how many accidents does humans create? Exactly. Right. You're 80% of all happened. accidents are human error. Right. In some way, shape or form. Right. So, um, and so will autonomy fix that? <laughs> will it cause more? I don't know. You know? Right. But uh, it's going to be an interesting, it's a wild ride. It's so fun to be in tech. You know, I've been a tech marketer most of my career. So it's always interesting. Yeah. So it's one of the things that you said that really stood out to me is, so going into COVID, I felt like no one felt like they ever needed to buy a laptop. Like they had their work laptop and then COVID happened. Like, oh, I probably need a personal laptop at home. And then coming out of COVID, AI happened. And now it sounds like you think there's going to be a renaissance of demand in the laptop space. Yeah. I mean, I think we're, the laptop is at an innovation inflection point for the first time in like, I would say 15 years. Right. Um, and COVID gave the, the, the PC industry a nice bump. Yeah. Dell had a great and year. It, right. It drove an upgrade cycle, yeah. um, primarily because the use case shifted. No longer was the laptop something that sat on the desk collecting dust until I needed, a, until I needed a bigger keyboard and a bigger screen. Right. Um, it became a communications device. It's how I connected with my Zoom, world yep. cause I couldn't connect with them physically. So Zoom, Teams, the PC became a primary communications device, less about surfing the web. Right, less about creating PowerPoints and on a bigger screen, it became a primary communications device, like the phone had been for so many years. Sure, um, but I but the context shifted, and we needed to have meetings, and we needed to look at multiple screens of people. So that gave this the PC a renaissance, a short term renaissance. Drove an upgrade cycle, uh, was a good couple of years, um, and then everyone upgraded their PC. Oh. I, I got a brand new PC. I don't need a new PC because historically the, the upgrade cycles of like four to six years, uh, right? And very long, unlike the smartphone, uh, which has historically been 11 to 24 months. So um, so now, uh, and that's primarily because there hasn't been a lot of innovation. Why do I need a new PC? This is fine, right? Um, and, and especially coming out of COVID. Oh, I have a new one. I bought it in 2021 or 2020 or whatever. It's fine. Um, but now with all these new experiences, that you're going to be able to extract from the PC because of AI um, and because of our work with Microsoft and the ecosystem, um, things that you never imagined you could do with your PC and um, and that you never able to do before with your PC are now going to become real. And that's, I think, really exciting. And we're going to see more of that later. I'm getting spring. excited just hearing you talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to like, I'm not going to um, uh, give away the um, uh, the, the surprise. We'll come back um, to you for that. When yeah. You're ready. Come back to me, yeah. you know, later on, uh, this year, but there are really amazing experiences when you can take the power of our Snapdragon platform and windows 11, um, or just windows in general and co-pilot, um, and our friends at HP and our friends at Lenovo and our friends at Dell and Samsung and Acer and Asus, et cetera, that when we all come together, it, we're going to deliver some really cool stuff. And, um, uh, we're just in phase one, you know, you got to educate what is Copilot, Microsoft, you know, they announced the key, you know, which yeah, is I great, step yeah. one, hey, there's something physical, you know, push and magic's going to happen. Um, and it's going to take some time. Um, so we, we've got about six months and then I think you're going to see some real magic happen. And yes, I think that will create a desire for, even though this may not be old yet, in that context of the traditional PC upgrade cycle, this is going to offer me so much more that's worth the trade in. Yeah, it's 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 like when you had to have the new smartphone every eleven months because there was so much new right. in the next one. I had Face I ID, it had real things. I could much better camera. Yeah, like I whatever. couldn't. I can't get by with this. Are you kidding me? Right. This is old, right? Yeah. Um, and so I have to have new for the first time in a really long time. We think that psychological phenomenon is going to happen in the PC space, which we're really excited about. So what does marketing look like for you? Is it mostly partnership marketing with those OEM partners that you 
just list it? I mean, that's a, it's part, if you look, you know, if my marketing mix was a wheel, yeah. um, right, or a pie chart, um, partner marketing is a big part of my mix. Of course. Just because of who we are. I am so blessed and honored to have so many great partners that I get to work with and through um, across product categories. I mean, amazing brands from BMW to Cadillac to Louis Vuitton to Bose. Louis Vuitton. Um, yeah, well, we can talk about that. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, to Samsung, right. obviously, to Microsoft. Um, and these are big, iconic culture brands. Yeah. Um, and But we play a significant and important role in feeding their brand ethos as they move their products more and more into the space of delivering technology driven experiences. And so by us working together with them and collaborating them, for example, in the case of Louis Vuitton, as you said, what do you mean you're working right, with Louis Vuitton? Right. <laughs> we are yet, not yet putting chips in bags. Right. That's um, what I'm uh, But, you know, could happen. Uh, but we power all of Louis Vuitton's um, smart devices. So their watch, um, their smart speaker, their earbuds Got it. Has, has has our technology inside. And they're a great partner, um, an iconic luxury brand, but they're a luxury brand. They're not a tech brand. So what we bring them is tech credit, right? So people can feel good about, oh my gosh, these Louis Vuitton earbuds look stunning, but I still want good audio. Quality. Yeah, they're going to work. Are they going right. to work? Right. Um, or this Louis Vuitton smartwatch looks stunning and it's definitely Louis Vuitton from a on brand perspective, but it's still got to work like a smartwatch. Yeah. So is it going to, is it going to deliver on my technology needs? Oh, it's powered by Snapdragon? Of course it's going to, right? Snapdragon stands for premium. Snapdragon stands for the best. Snapdragon delivers. Ab absolutely. So that tech cred is what we bring to the party for some of these brands that are, you would, you would ask yourself, what do you mean Louis Vuitton? Or what do you mean, you know, a Peloton, for example? So that's really exciting. And I get to work with these CMOs and these, these, these partners all the time and coming up with really fun, interesting, cool co-marketing types of experiences. That fits their brand equity pillars and also drives the messaging that you Absolutely. want. Absolutely. It's not about disintermediating their brand ethos. Of course not. It's about amplifying it. Um, and um, this whole idea that, oh, if I talk about your brand in the context of my brand, that takes away from my brand. That's BS. Yeah, I agree. I'm sorry. Right. And that's old thinking, by the way. Um, and by the way, there's still a lot of people out there, <laughs> especially in the automotive industry, <laughs> that think that way. Right. But it's, it's total crap, right? Um, and I mean- I was so excited. I was in the New York subway, um, maybe six months ago or so, or maybe more. And I saw an ad where a bunch of brands came together with a single message, but they were individual brands, but they were all marketing kind of the same thing. Um, and so this whole collaboration idea, and you see collabs happening all the time, right? Adidas and Montclair. Yeah. Um, right. Um, so, you know, it, it's happening organically anyway. Um, I, I'm just so lucky that I get the opportunity to work with with some of these amazing brands and form these relationships with these other CMOs and share best practices, um, uh, w which has been a good opportunity. So that's a significant portion of the mix. But, you know, there's traditional advertising, um, there's events, there's comms, PR. Um, and then two of the areas that I've been focused on for the past two years with my team are building community, number one. Community which of you say, uh, Community of consumers okay. for Snapdragon. Building affinity for Snapdragon through building community. And number two is uh, brand partnerships. Um, not like customer brand partnerships like with Louis Vuitton or with Cadillac, but brand partnerships with brands and um, companies slash products slash franchises that align with our brand values um, and that we together can tell a, a joint story as well as our individual stories. And we, it's a win-win for them and it's a win-win for us. So yeah. a perfect example is our relationship with Manchester United. Um, uh, and you, you know, why are you doing something with Manchester United? Um, well, in the context of building community for Snapdragon, which is now 14 million strong. And Snapdragon globally, is your, is your, is that your new go-to-consumer brand? Like as Qualcomm? Well, it's been around for a long time, right. but it is our, it is our B2C brand. I've heard a lot more about it as of late, obviously yeah. with the yeah. AI. And, right. and, and, you know, the, the irony is that the, the markets where Snapdragon has the least amount of awareness is in the U.S. Right. <laughs> where we're headquartered um, and in Europe. Um, but, it, you know, you walk down the street in Shanghai, you ask some, a consumer, do you know what Snapdragon is? They're going to 90 percent of them are going to say yes. Right. So I've got, you know, typical high levels of consumer brand awareness in Asia, in, in Latin America, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really been sort of the Western markets that that we haven't invested in and haven't focused on. 
but that's going to change with the advent of PC. Um, we didn't really feel like we needed to do it for smartphone because some of those markets are duopolies. You know, there's one company right. and then there's the other company and yeah. then that's it. Right. Um, and we we're partnered with the other company and we do lots of co-marketing with them. Um, and so, uh, so we were good. Uh, but now we do need to build affinity for Snapdragon because the PC space is a different space. Um, we're starting to see an automotive, a, a, an openness and a willingness to give us attribution for what we're bringing to the table. Because again, automotive companies historically are not tech companies. And they try, sometimes they try to mask as them and they create poor software experiences for the user. Some of them just wave the flag and they do car play and consumers love it and that's it. And then they're, yeah, which is great for consumers um, and great for the company that makes CarPlay, right. but not so great for the car company. Right. Because then they lose that relationship. Yeah. Connection. Right. Our platforms enable them to actually build something meaningful. Right. Which relevant, is why they'd rather do which that. Which is rather, rather yeah. they do that. So, and, and then give us attribution for that, which is fa fantastic. So building community and brand partnerships are really important. We have 14 million Snapdragon insiders around the world, which every day I'm astounded and amazed by the fact that 14 million people are interested in a product that they can't actually buy. Right. Um, but they are tech influencer, tech enthusiasts. They love talking about technology. Well, they, they love... believe in the promise of what it unlocks, right? Exactly. Ultimately. And they right. want to peel the onion back. Yeah. Right. They want to, they just, they don't buy into it. It's just the plastics and the display and the wrapper. It's what's inside that's making this happen. And it's kind of back to the Intel inside playbook a yeah. little bit, but if in a, Brand new context, right? I mean, Intel did that brilliantly. And I was part of that ride for the five and a half years I was at Intel of, of building Intel inside as a meaningful, um, full funnel, right? Sort of thing where consumers were like walking into a store and saying, I really don't care if it's an HP or a Dell or I think, but it better be Intel. Inside. Yeah, it, it was a fantastic job of doing Brilliant. that. Yeah. Um, and then over time, obviously that device category lost relevance yep. with consumers. So thereby the Intel brand was so attached to that product category that the Intel brand started losing yeah. relevance. And then now anyone under the age of 35 may not even know what Intel is or care um, as the as the primary digital experience interaction of humans moved from that big, clunky, heavy device to something that fits in your pocket. Yep. And that's where our DNA is. Right. And that's where we've been for several years. And so we have this opportunity, right, to kind of move into this next generation. And, and we're not we're not a one trick pony. It's just not about one product category. It's phones. It's it's tablets. It's wearables. It's hearables. Cars. It's cars. Yeah. It's PCs. It's et cetera. So my birth is wide. Um, and, and I get to, to, to kind of play in this bigger playground, awesome. which is fantastic. Um, and so um, so with all these goals to build Snapdragon as a, a culture brand, a uh, consumer culture brand, it's a, which is a big ask for my CEO. By the way, I have an amazing CEO who believes in marketing. For an engineering driven company- You can tell. That right. is where we've struggled for years. My team and I have struggled for years just to make marketing like important. Cristiano is a huge believer in it. And so that's so, as a CMO, it's so helpful. And I also have a great relationship with our CFO um, who also you know understands um, and I have a great relationship with our CIO because he's my great partner on crime and reimagining our digital experience. So um, we have a great executive team and uh, and it's it's fun, it makes it fun, but it also helps me do my job, right? I wouldn't be able to do my job without that enablement, without that, that permission that he provides me. Um, and one of his tasks that he's given me recently is I want, I want Snapchat to be a culture brand. Like that's a big ass. It is. So we're working on Especially that. Especially for a brand that people can't touch and feel. Right. I'm like, right. dude, really? Right. Um, um, I'm like, I'm good, but am I that good? Yeah. Um, no, so I, I, it's it's interesting. We're going to take that on. Um, we're going to see how far we can get. Um, and it's going to help. It's going to, it's a team sport. So it's going to take help from everybody. Um, but we're, but we're, we're taking on that ask. So brand partnerships are going to be really important to that. Uh, specifically attaching ourselves to brands like Manchester United, largest sports brand in the world. 1.1 billion fans. We want to build more community. We want to attach to their community. We want to co we want to cross pollinate. Um, there's lots of overlap. Um, it's an amazing partnership. They're amazing. They're an amazing brand. They're premium. They're the best of the best. Snapdragon premium, the best of the best. Brand values are aligned, um, and and they provide me scale and reach that I would have to spend four times as much on traditional advertising methods to get that exposure for my brand than what. I'm spending to become the new front of shirt partner for Manchester United starting in July of 2024, which I'm super excited about. Um, only the seventh front of shirt partner in it's a Manchester United. I'm sure, yeah, big investment for and for us especially, a big step. 
But when I when I showed the ROI and when I showed the efficiency of it. And the popularity of the and, sport. And the popularity of the sport globally. globally yeah. Football is, is just is exploding globally. But just the ROI and the efficiency versus, hey, you want to triple my marketing budget every year for the next five right, years? Right. Or do you want to do this? Um, it was like, that makes sense. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. Our F1 partnership, especially as it relates to our automotive business, is really important with Mercedes. The Mercedes team is amazing. Toto is amazing. Uh, all of the people at Mercedes, AMG, Petronas are amazing. And innovation for automotive often comes from F1. Right. So being in the heart of that innovation, right, with our brand makes sense. So our F1 partnership, our Manchester United partnerships, um, all those types of things are really important to building out the Snapdragon brand ethos. So they're a big part of my mix as well. Awesome. So shifting gears to wrap up. And and one thing I just... I'm observing is that you obviously have a lot of passion towards the space that you're in. Sure. You know, there's some people who are in technology marketing who before that were selling soda or toothpaste. It's like, oh, just plug in brand here. But I can tell that you really love what you're marketing, what you're selling, and you believe in it, yeah. which I would imagine makes you that much more effective at what you do. I think anybody. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you love what you do and if you believe in whatever you're whatever you're you're selling or whatever you're making or creating. Um, you have to believe in it or else why do it? Right. Um, well, some people just do it because it's a job and for the it, money. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Peace. Um, right. You know, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not built that way. Right. Um, I probably like be heavily medicated. By right. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, but I definitely love the fact that I've worked in this technology space for so long and what we do actually does change the world. Yeah. Right. We put the internet. Especially now. In your, yeah. We put the in internet 2024. in your Right. Right. Um, we've done all these amazing shifts societally speaking um not just with consumers or businesses or enterprises or, or but it just societally we've driven this change and yes there's been good and bad obviously as as a byproduct as we talked about with social media and you could blame us for the for the for the social media backlash because we enabled it right by putting it on your phone um and and allowing you to connect right so so I get it um but it's been really really gratifying and rewarding i can't imagine like the, to your earlier point about, hey, some people just go into work and clock it in and go home and it's fine. Um, and you know, again, no judgments, but I can't imagine working that way because you spend a lot of your time at work. Yeah. So you might as well love what you do. Absolutely. So yeah. final question for some of our younger listeners is, sure. if you had a chance to speak with 20-year-old Don and give him <laughs> advice entering his career to someday hope to end up in a, in a seat in a role like yourself, what would you say? What would I say? Um, I would say... Um, when a, when a window of opportunity opens, jump first, ask questions later. Um, I think I've always been a, a, a believer that you have to take your destiny into your own hands. No one is going to hand it to you on a silver platter. Right. And if, if, when you lose control of your destiny, that's when you lose control of your path. Um, and, and you can't own your path anymore. And it happens to a lot of people because the corporate kind of entity, the corporate life tends to suck you in. Yeah. And then it has a gravitational pull and kind of end up wherever. And then all of a sudden you feel out of control, but you don't know what to do about it. So if you can just keep your mind set in a place where it's like, okay, this doesn't seem right. I know I have a centered perspective on where I want to go and who I want to be and what I want to do over the next you know, two, five, 10, whatever years. I'm I'm going to make decisions based on that and I'm going to block out the noise and I'm going to reject you know the inertia or the gravitational pull when it's pulling me in a direction where I don't believe I should go. Um I'm always celebrating celebrating people who come into our organization and who leave our organization. Um especially if they're going on to something better for them. Um right because I think that's amazing for them. Um and then one of my mentors, Sue Swenson, taught me once um, in, a, in a performance review because I'm, I'm very results oriented. Um, and as my team will tell you, um, and, and early on in my career, that manifested itself a little bit in a bull in a china shop type of behavior, um, where it's like, I don't care what's in my way, the results over there, I'm going to clear the decks and get the result. Dead bodies be damned. Right. right. And I had a review with my, my boss at the time, Sue Swenson. And she said, the, your results were fantastic. Amazing. Um, but I'm r- rating you at a whatever. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I, I overachieved. And she said, absolutely. But how you went about it has some things to be desired. And she just took me through it. She said, you can't leave dead bodies in your path. You can't have broken glass. You can't like, and, and those are all metaphors for 
you know, you can't do it in a way that ne ne neglects the human element, neglects empathy, right? Neglects uh, collaboration, yeah. relationships to get to that goal. I mean, yes, some people can, and it, it may get the result, but then the aftermath. It's just like athletes with poor sportsmanship, same thing. Exactly. And it, it can get you so far, right. right? For so long. So the how you do things is as important as the what you do. Yeah. Um, and that's a piece of advice that was given to me. And it actually helped me correct my behavior um, over time. And I, I would, I would, if I could save the young Don from <laughs> the bull in the china shop syndrome uh, or anybody else out there, I would gladly go back and do that. I love that. Well, I want to thank you for joining today. It's been awesome. Your passion uh, sure. comes out and I know that you're in a very exciting time at the company. I can't wait to see what's next. And hopefully we could have you back on some point later this year, next year to see some of these new innovations that are coming out. Love to be back. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Don. On behalf of Susie and I, we team, thanks again to Don McGuire, SVP and CMO for Qualcomm. I'm going to do it again. On behalf of Susie and I, we team, thanks again to Don McGuire, SVP and CMO of Qualcomm for joining us today. Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon. Bye-bye. The Speed of Culture is brought to you by Susie as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and AGAS Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for The Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.